I'm Ira Wolf. Welcome to another episode of Geek Skeezers Googleization, a show from the People Forward Network. And I'm Jason Cochran. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We are the heart and soul of crucial conversations focused on helping you reimagine your tomorrow and exploring the convergence of technology, people, and work. On this episode, you're going to hear from Dr. Joe Sirio on fear and resistance. Joe's a popular and entertaining trainer and conference keynote speaker on topics such as transformational leadership, positive interaction with difficult people, understanding fear and resistance, increasing productivity in a world of distractions, and overcoming barriers to improve performance. And here's the thing. Joe knows all about personal leadership and overcoming fear of change. He spent 10 years in the former Soviet Union investigating the Russian mafia and working with the KGB as part of his work in the Organized Crime Control Department. These experiences not only shaped who he is, but also how he teaches and develops other people. And he's also the author of the critically acclaimed book, Investigating the Russian Mafia. And he also has a new book out that's titled Vodka, Hookers, and the Russian Mafia, My Life in Moscow. Ira, anytime we get to talk about these things, I get really excited, and especially how they tie into adaptability and change. And here recently, the American Psychological Association checked in with adults in February just to see how we're doing. And the results were terrifying that they got from this last February. Over 80% of the adults reported that events over the last two years, things like the pandemic, inflation, the war in Ukraine now, all of those have had a significant negative effect on their mental health. In fact, many of the respondents described it as a constant barrage of crises without a break over the last two years. You've heard me say this a million times. The listeners have probably heard me say this a million times. Humans are addicted to certainty. We've lived that way. And although we've always struggled with change, over time it happened slower. It, it sort of was in slow motion when we look back. But living in what is now the never normal world is forcing a lot of us to go cold turkey. And we got to break a habit. We got to break this addiction to certainty habit. And making change work takes courage and it takes confidence. But fear seems to get in our way. And you use the word terrify and uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity terrifies in a lot of people. And this this came to mind. And I just found this yesterday again. There was an author and a futurist named Alvin Toffler. Now, many of the young people may have never heard of him, but he wrote a book in 1970. I still have it somewhere nearby because I reference it all the time. It was called Future Shock. And I, I just found this clip yesterday, and, and this was something that Orson Welles, for those who don't know Orson Welles, just look him up, Google him. He talked about what future shock was a sickness that comes from too much change in too short of time, 2022. It's a feeling that nothing is permanent anymore. It's the reaction to changes that happen so fast that we can't absorb them. It's the premature arrival of the future. And for those that are unprepared, its effects can be devastating. That is so true, Iron. so eye-opening. And so, I mean, we're thrilled that we have Joe today. It makes me think back to the Fear Factor show. If folks remember that on NBC, it had Joe Rogan on it. Well, guess what? Today on Geek Skeezers Googleization, we have our own Joe, Dr. Joe Sirio, that we're going to bring on now. And he is going to help us figure out how we overcome those fears and we still live the life and achieve the dreams that we want. So without further ado, let's bring Joe onto the show. Hey, Joe, welcome to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. Great to be here. Joe, why don't you give us and our listeners kind of the rundown in terms of the, the speed dating version of how you became an expert in these areas of helping people remove fear and live the life of their dreams. Yeah, so I grew up in pretty much constant fear. And a result of that was I wasn't really making any conscious decisions for myself. So when I was in college, still petrified and full of anxiety, going to class short of breath, I opened up the course catalog, twirled my finger in the air, put it down on the paper and landed on a class called Who Are the Soviets? So I started studying that and just because I, I didn't want to do that. I had no interest in the Soviet Union. I wanted to be a writer and a speaker, but I was too scared to do that. I didn't have the courage to be myself. 
So I just followed whatever direction the waves took me in. And it to me, the communists and KGB were a little bit less scary than my father. So I ran to Moscow and I did what I did. I just started getting involved in it and I got knee deep in it. So I, I moved to Russia. I studied in Russia. I did tours in Russia, came back, finished my master's degree. Then I moved back to Moscow and was a consultant for my own company at first and then for the world's leading corporate investigation and business intelligence firm investigating the Russian mafia and working with the cops and law enforcement and KGB. And, and when I came out of that experience, other than a short stint driving a cab in New York City, I went to Texas and did my PhD. And what I realized was, number one, this was the gateway for me to get into my speaking career. And number two, I also realized that all of my personal experience and specializing in leadership and organizational behavior and going into tons of prisons in Russia and China and Texas and all over the country, all of the roads were coming together and all of the roads ended on fear. And the, the fear factor was the thing that I noticed that across any industry, this is what people were freaking out about, right? So you think about stress. I just noticed people stressed and they run around saying, I'm so stressed out, I'm so stressed out. But no one ever stopped and said, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid. They just really said stress. And then it, I came to realize that stress is the manifestation, is the outward manifestation of people's fear. So I just started digging into fear, stress, uh, resilience, time management, public speaking, all the things that have the thread of fear through them and that scared me to death when I was growing up. And I realized that I wasn't the only one. I wasn't alone. And so I just started building my career out of leadership academies and leadership programs and keynotes on those topics that seem to resonate across the board. As you're talking there, people thought I always took risk, but there's this whole other story of things that I chose not to do, not to talk about. I avoided things because I wasn't very good at it. I wasn't tall enough. I wasn't big enough. It was always an excuse. It was always a rationalization. And over the past few years, and the listeners will know this, we focused on adaptability, how people can overcome this addiction to certainty and, you know, overcome this fear. And it, it rolls back to Carol Dweck's work, uh, which you're probably familiar with, growth mindset and fixed mindset. So this, this fear of, I'm just not ready for that promotion. I'm not good enough for the job. Maybe next year I'll apply for that. A lot of things are going on right now, and it seems that there's been a shift at least with you know another record month of people quitting their jobs. Do you see people being less fearful or is the stress just so great that the, the straw broke the camel's back, but they may not take advantage of the opportunities that are presenting them? So there's a lot in there, but with you know, 51, 52 million people quitting their jobs over the last 12 months, it seems like there's a shift going on. When we get ourselves in a certain position where we can't avoid things any longer, right? We have this balance and we stay in the comfort zone for a long time because nothing's forced us to get out of it. You know, life is okay. We keep going along. We, we have our job, we pay our bills and we kind of get a little bit uh, complacent in a sense because we can keep the fear in our head and still live our outside life. But things have gotten to the point where we have reached a tipping point, like you said, a shift where we say, you know what, this is crazy. I actually don't know if there's going to be a nuclear weapon dropped. I actually don't know if Putin is going to run across Europe. I actually don't know what's coming tomorrow. We just had this pandemic that seems to be ongoing, lingering with us forever, whatever. And we went through such uncertainty for a, a concentrated period of time where we thought we knew what our lives were about. And we thought we knew what the future was. And we've had shifts like this before, maybe not quite as intense, where we say, wait a second, my old man worked at GM for 30 years and got his gold watch. And then computers came along. And then internet came along. And people said, I'm not doing that. And now we're at a similar shift that's so much greater in intensity because the number of deep and profound elements, factors that are coming at us, are they're overwhelming. It's too much. It's too much. It's all the things that you listed, right? Pandemic, Putin, whatever. And now we stop and say, wait a second, I actually have no control. 
over pretty much anything. So maybe I ought to take a step back and try to get some control. And maybe control isn't working for someone else. And maybe I'm realizing life is way too short to spend it in a cubicle that someone else built for me. And maybe I need to take my life by the horns and live on my terms so that when I die, and I don't know if it's tomorrow or 40 years from now, that I actually do it in a way that I felt good about living. I really think there's a lot to that. Maybe it's unspoken, but people are realizing an awful lot of things we can't control. And so, Joe, what are some of the things that you learned in, in your dealings with the Russian mafia and the work that you did in your previous life that have helped you now? where you're helping people overcome those fears to live more of the, the life that they want and to pursue the things that matter to them. One of the ways I think about it is structure, like good structure with a lot of flexibility inside that structure. Like I really want to have a sense of where, what I'm doing, where I'm going, what is my family about? What are the values that we have? But the fact of the matter is, like you alluded to earlier, things are shifting so hard that we don't know what's coming next. So how about we put some fundamentals back in place? What are our value system? And we see this in the organizations that I work with in terms of organizational culture. And what you find out is they've never really created a culture. They have a culture of what would you call like happenstance, like ad hocracy. And, and they haven't really decided who they want to be. So on an individual level, we have to decide who we want to be. On a corporate organizational level, we have to decide who we want to be so that we understand what our values are and we can put in place guiding principles for how we're going to face all these things that, that come along at us. So in terms of the case of Russia, one of the ways that I was able to deal with things was because of the people who were around me. One of the best leaders I ever met in my life was my supervisor, who was a general in the Soviet police. He said, come into my office anytime you want. I had an office across the hall from him. And he said, come in my office whenever you want. He would give me stacks of intelligence reports and he would let me sit in on any meeting I wanted to sit in on. And I watched how he interacted with his people. And I watched how he interacted with his family. And this was the kicker. It actually had nothing to do with the Russian mafia. I saw him one day in his apartment get off the couch in half a nanosecond when his wife called him from the kitchen. And I was like, what are you doing? Do you know who you are? You're the deputy chief of organized crime control for the whole Soviet Union. You're not supposed to move that fast when your wife calls. And of course, I thought that because I grew up in a family of 12 kids and my father never had to move. So I never saw that kind of role model in that sense. And so watching him, he was the outward example of all the philosophical things we talk about. He was commitment in action. He was leadership in action. He was dedication in action. And to see that at 23 years old, that really turned me inside out. I said, wow, there are alternatives to models that I saw growing up, and I can be more like him, and I can change things about my life. And just one other thing is international travel changes everything. If you go overseas and you live for a while, you can't but help have your whole internal life turned inside out. I lived in China for a year back in the 80s. I lived in Russia a long time. And I saw totally different worlds and totally different ways of doing things and totally different ways of thinking. And I saw amazing people who put up with all kinds of things. Now, last point, you think about the last two years and what Americans went through. Toilet paper flew off the shelves. Paper towels were gone. Clark's wipes, you couldn't find them. All right. And that's dramatic for us and traumatic for us. And then I think about what we went through in the 90s in Moscow. For years, there were no goods on the store shelves. And not just toilet paper, like anything. And the Soviet experience, they went through this for year after year after year after year, where you didn't know what was going to show up in the store. And you didn't know whether you were going to stand in line for three hours to buy what you need to buy for dinner that night. And that was their regular rhythm of life. So it kind of depends on perspective. That's a lot of where our fear comes is what's your perspective? What was your lived experience growing up for starters? And how do you process things that come at you? Joe, you mentioned something there, and, and this is still stuck in my head, is that you've overcome your fears. You talk about living boldly, living your dream, and you've done that. 
what causes one person to take that leap, to gain that confidence, to reach that breaking point, to break that addiction, and others seem to decline? Yeah, I think some of it is who you surround yourself with, number one. Number two, what tools you have in your toolkit. Because, you know, the name of my book is Overcoming Fear, but it's actually, it's overcoming the paralysis of being afraid, but it's not the absence of fear. It's new tools and new perspective when fear arises. So I've spent a lot of time developing my own tools and techniques. If I can give you a very quick example, last year I was dragged into an episode of 48 Hours, quite surprisingly. And I went out to LA to do an interview on 48 Hours. And the morning of the interview called me and said, the car's coming to pick you up. And I was nervous. I was not quite fearful, but I was definitely on my way to getting there. And They said, don't worry, don't worry. It's only 15 million people. I said, yeah, please stop saying that. You know, so I sat on my bed and I used three of my go-to tools. One is deep abdominal breathing to turn off the stress response and turn on the relaxation response. You can do that for a minute. You don't have to do that very long. So deep abdominal breathing. Number two, I thought about my mother who had passed away in April of 2019 and her raising 12 kids and all the rest of it. I thought about this general in Russia. I thought about people I admire and how they conduct themselves. And number three was, I thought about the World Trade Center. So I grew up on Long Island. I have friends who died in the World Trade Center. All of us had knew somebody, 30, 40 families in every town on Long Island lost people. So I thought about the World Trade Center. And the way I deal with fear is to say, look, there is nothing in my life that comes even remotely close to what those people had to deal with. Oh, I'm afraid of public speaking. I'm afraid of writing my next book. Shut up. Just sit down and acknowledge your own fear and then put it in perspective, compare it to something else. Because our fear is us focusing on that thing that we hate so much that we've stretched it into this huge monster that only exists inside our head. We're not talking about danger. We're talking about fear that we've created in our minds and that we've gone over and over and over. And so we've gotten to the habit of being afraid of that thing, right? Well, let's call it public speaking. People have developed the habit of being afraid. Oh, that's right. I'm supposed to be afraid of this thing. That just reinforces the power of that fear. So you need tools and techniques to counterbalance. And for me, one of my big go-tos is the World Trade Center and what happened on 9-11. Joe, those are such brilliant insights there. And I hope that a lot of those tips will be really helpful for our listeners. I know one for me, I'm not a fear expert like you are, but one of the things for me, I often find I'll get myself in a rut whenever there might be a new opportunity that's presented. And instead of thinking about everything that could go right, I think about everything that could go wrong. And and it takes a lot of mindset shifting and work on framing things more in the positive light And it's like, take the leap, do it and find out. A lot of times the the best parts of the journey in life are the things that are surprises, but focusing on the things that could go right. And the other thing you mentioned there too, relaxation, just want to reinforce that for our listeners. You can find YouTube videos. There's lots of free apps out there that'll walk you through some relaxation techniques. I do autogenic phrases with my oldest son, who's eight, before he goes to bed every single night and he loves it. It helps calm his mind and it helps him realize that even though he might think he's relaxed, once you go through one of those activities, you don't realize that you're kind of going around with a set of lenses on where you're not fully relaxed. But then you do one of these techniques and then you're like, okay, there's the relaxation point where I feel like I've let everything go. So love those tips that you shared with our audience. Yeah, there's one more that helps a lot. And in my audiences, when I do leadership academies, really resonate with this. My younger brother, Steve Serio, who has a psychology background and is a brilliant professional photographer, he and I are always throwing out this phrase. And the phrase is, control the controllables. Control the controllables. I can't control COVID. I can only control my response to it. I can't control traffic, politics, money. You know, in a sense, I can't control the weather. I can't control. Oh, there are so many things I can't control. But the question is, what can I control? And how much control am I exhibiting over the things I can control? Do I wake up when I know I really need to wake up? Do I go to bed when I know I need to go to bed? Am I watching my weight? Am I eating healthy? Am I having crucial conversations where 
I'm resolving things instead of running away from things. There's a handful of really important things that are in our control, and most of life actually isn't. So when we come to that realization, we start defining a little more closely, what is it actually that I can control? There's a couple of things that you mentioned, Joe, and they're really brilliant. I've been writing them down here and I can't wait to re-listen to what we just talked about. One is that fear is not danger. And I think You know, when we're afraid to get on that stage, you're afraid to apply for that job or afraid to to speak up about something that we see that's wrong. It's not danger. It's generally, I won't say always, but generally not life threatening, as in the situations that, that you talked about, the World Trade Center, circumstances of being in the Ukraine. But it's just it's our fear. It's our fear of our unknown, what's going to happen. So I think that's a great message. And the other important thing is. We're supposed to be fearful. That's being human. Keeps us alive also. Yeah, absolutely. So we got to bring in your experience in Russia. I I grew up crawling under desks because Russia was going to, you know, launch our nuclear war. And it's like, you know, Berlin Wall comes down and here we are 50 years later, 60 years later, talking about the same thing. What were some of the scariest encounters you had when you were in in Russia? People ask me that question a lot. and, And I have to give you the almost kind of counterintuitive answer. I can't even think of them. There weren't any. There weren't any. And I'll tell you why. Because I started getting involved with the Soviet Union when I was 19 years old. So in some respects, I grew up there and I grew up around cops. So by the time I was interacting with Russian cops and even KGB, they were pretty normal people to me. right? So from that perspective, it wasn't such a bad deal. When I was growing up in Russia through my 20s and 30s, I was seeing how the place functioned. So by the time I started meeting gangsters, I understood where they were coming from and why they were doing what they were doing. And I wasn't messing with their money, right? So one of the big rules is don't mess with their money. So if you don't mess with their money, they're not going to break your legs, you know? So, so I wasn't messing with their money and I would meet with them. So for example, I also, by the time I went into Russian prisons, I had already been in Chinese prisons. I had already been in American prisons. So I met some of the big gangsters inside Russian prison. And even when we were speeding people to the airport in the middle of the night, you know, families of business people who were being threatened under armed guard, to me, it wasn't scary. And I don't know, it may be because I'm not smart enough to realize I should have been scared. I I don't know. But like, I knew what I was doing. I knew who was around me. I knew who had my back. I understood the environment. I speak Russian. I had access to KGB files and I had access to police files. So I had a really good picture of what was happening. And even on the streets in the 90s, people were saying how dangerous it was in Moscow. And it was dangerous. I could hear gunfire all the time outside my apartment. And I saw people get scooped up off the streets in the middle of the night, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, right across the street from the Kremlin. This car of gangsters would come racing up and grab another guy out of his car and take him away. And you didn't want to be that guy. So I just made sure I was never that guy. But I'll tell you what, the most uncomfortable moments had nothing to do with mafia at all. It had to do with the drunk guy who would hang out in my lobby of my apartment building. And I had to shove the door open to get his sleeping body out of my way. And you don't know if he's going to wake up and hit you or something. You know, it just wasn't that scary. Oh, you know what? The scariest moment probably of all the moments I had was when I sneaked into the May Day Parade, those big parades that march across Red Square and people carrying banners and and all this stuff. I snuck into that and I was marching across Red Square with a Russian friend of mine. And these people in front of me kept turning around and looking at me because I looked like a foreigner. And as we got to Red Square, there's a line of people on the side of us. And there's a man in a suit and a sash across his chest said, guest of the parade. And the man next to him was in uniform. And then there's another guy with a guest of the parade and man next to him is in uniform. And I realized, and I basically said, holy shit, that's KGB. And those were KGB. And these ladies keep looking at me. And I'm just like, stop looking at me. Stop looking. And now I'm looking forward in such an unnatural way so that I don't get their attention. And I feel like I'm getting their attention just from the way I'm cold, holding my, and I had sweat just streaming down my, down my back. You know, so there were a lot of moments like that where I snuck into a military manufacturing factory and people start yelling at me, but nothing happened after that. 
in all of these crazy things that, that were going on, nothing ever happened. Nobody ever pursued. Nobody ever stopped me from going in that factory. Nobody stopped me from the parade. It was just, it was kind of weird. And I got used to just doing stuff, you know, I just got used to throwing myself into really bizarre situations. You kind of alluded to this idea of you were prepared, you had a plan. And that's why a lot of the stressful situations you were in, even though for a lot of us, just as we're hearing the story, it might start elevating our heart rates. You were able to stay calm in those situations and you knew what to do. If you're dealing with fear, there are two things that you can do. And one is acknowledge fear. And the second is to prepare like crazy. Prepare, prepare, prepare. My leadership academy is six months long. And we don't talk about leadership until module six. And people are astounded by that because module one is on fear and resistance. Module two is about emotional intelligence. Module three is about time management and stress management. All the things that bring out fear in people. So then we talk about how to deal with fear. We spend a lot of time on that. And the results have been ridiculous because people are losing weight. People are getting promotions. People are doing things that they never did before. And I really think that fear factor is the one that we have to be talking about a lot more and creating tools and techniques for people to put it in perspective and to be able to walk their way through that fear. We have a few minutes here, and we've mentioned it a couple times, but tell us a little bit about what vodka hookers and the Russian mafia is actually about. It's about the from the beginning to the end. It's about from the moment I twirled my finger in the air and put it down on the course catalog that pulled me into the vortex of the Soviet Union in 1983 or so, up until last week. Because a, a publisher is picking up this book, and I wrote a new chapter about what's happening in Ukraine and why it's happening and what the Russian mentality is around things like law and power and what Vladimir Putin thinks of himself from a, a Russian cultural perspective. So the publishers picked it up. It's going to come out in uh, the end of May. The book was about figuring out myself in the context of the Soviet Union. And what I didn't realize is that the book is also about my relationship with my father. And that ended up being some of the threads that went through the narrative about the fact that the Soviet Union had the heavy hand of communism lifted suddenly at the same time when the heavy hand of my Sicilian father was lifted from me and my family when he died in 1989. And so it's a parallel of these experiences and then going through these stories I just told you and those strange interconnections of all the things that I experienced in the 1990s and how they raised their heads again in 2016 around the election. So there are a lot of just ridiculous intersections between my life and Russian mafia, U.S. politics, what's happening in Ukraine, being the ninth of 12 kids and growing up in that house. And it just, it was like, okay, figure out how it's all connected. And that's what the book is about. Excellent. And it's available now on your website? Right now it's available at vodkahookers.com. And we'll relaunch the whole thing after the, the publisher you know, moves forward. Can't wait to type that into my website and my <laughs> wife wants to know what, <laughs> what, what am I doing? <laughs> Research for work. I've gotten a little pushback from some people. They said, look, HR wants to know what that subject line is about. Why are we writing about vodka and hookers? Yeah, I can, I can see the warning bells going off. Joe, we say this every week, and you know, we've, had, we've had the opportunity to really interview some fascinating guests. And at the end, it's always like, how did, where'd the time go? It runs out so fast. There are so many storylines that we have started on. That we literally, I can't even say scratch the surface is probably an overstatement. Um, so we'd love to have you back at some point. But we got a couple of things to do before we go. We, we've got our one of our favorite parts of the show, the lightning round, where we really get to know you a little bit. And you've given us some hints of some of the questions that we normally ask. But this one we didn't. If you won the lottery tomorrow, what would you do? Exactly the same thing I'm doing now. That's living the dream. That's, that's about that. Yeah. In fact, I went to a doctor's appointment this morning and, and the assistant looked down and she says, I think we got your, your birth dates wrong. I said, what is it? And I said, no, that's right. And it's like, well, are you retired? And I go, no, I've got like three businesses I'm starting. <laughs> so three, three projects. I was like, yeah. So yeah, if I won the lottery, 
you know, at this point, it's like help other people put things away, get a little bit more comfortable. But no, I wouldn't stop working. We met one of your classmates from high school along the way. What would they be most surprised at if we mentioned the name Joe Sirio? I think they'd be surprised at the entire story. The thing about it is they all thought that I was uber confident when I was in high school and college because I learned how to mask it really well. So they wouldn't be surprised that I did crazy things, but they would ask me, where did you get the nerve to go to the Soviet Union back then at 18, 19 years old? They'd be shocked at the mafia. They'd be shocked at the KGB and all that business. You know, like the whole Russian story, I think they'd be pretty surprised about. Do you have a favorite book that you're reading now or a favorite book at all? I don't do favorites for the most part. But there are two books, one that I read several times called The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. And I realized at some point that that was actually the story of my life. And I ended up coming full circle and realizing that all the riches and all the treasures that I had were already mine before I went to Russia and that the family I came from was amazing and that the parents I had were incredible. And they all created just unbelievable opportunities for me. There's another book that's just an absolutely lovely book. On the back cover, it says, and I have no embarrassment saying this, it says, for ages 9 to 12. And I read this book twice already, and I will read it again. It's called Circus Mirandas by Cassie Beasley. And it's about a kid who learns to dream, and he learns to fly, and he learns to become himself. And I think that's really the bottom line of life. It's the bottom line of my classes. It's the bottom line of leadership. It's the bottom line of modeling the way for other people. That's like, we got to add that to the growth mindset module that we're building. What's your word of the year? My word of the year is yes. My word of the year is yes. I'm going skydiving for the first time. I still don't know why I agreed to this, but the reason I agreed is because I decided I have to say yes. I have to say yes to things that scare me. I, I'm having a running battle with that. That was supposed to be my, a gift two years ago to, to skydive. And it, it was the weather was terrible. So they canceled it. And then my wife is, I, you can't go. <laughs> you, so I have to get her over the fear, not my fear, but I have to get her over the fear to be able to do that. Joe, it has been an absolute pleasure. I uh, really appreciate you being here. I know our Googleization Nation really enjoyed you being here as well, sharing your story. Amazing story. Fascinating. Thank you so much. This was great. I love talking with you guys. A blast. And hopefully we can get you back, especially after the new book's out. I'd love to. Thanks. Absolutely fascinating, Ira. Yeah, I'm speechless. I shared some of my takeaways before. One note I read, he didn't say this, but it, we have to give ourselves permission uh, to make mistakes. But, uh, you know, I, I still love that. The, the lines he talked about is, is that don't confuse fear with danger. And we're supposed to be afraid. We should be afraid. That's human. I mean, really, we talk about, I mean, saying, oh, I can jump out of a plane or I can take this job or I can quit my job. No fear is re really not healthy. It's not a healthy response. And that's sort of the crazy side. But we have to learn to, to deal with it. I know he talks about overcoming it, but he was very clear is that that doesn't mean we eliminate it. It just learned that we have to deal with it and how we frame uh, the situations, control the controllables. I love that, Ira. And to piggyback on that one, the planning and preparation piece, too, for me, uh, really hit home when he was talking about the things he went through to prepare him for those moments. And as you said, you know, that doesn't mean you're not fearful in those moments. It just means you know what to do. You know how to manage that emotion, but still make the right decisions in those moments to get a successful outcome. And when you chat with experts like Joe, who have been in those high pressure situations, and it's the planning and preparation whenever you hear them talk about what gets them through it. And I think we just need to understand what Joe is sharing with us is we have to plan and prepare for these things in life so that we're not just always reacting to what's happening to us. And that's where the coaching that you've developed on adaptability and developing a growth mindset and becoming more resilient. These are things that we can actually plan and prepare for to develop and build those skills like muscles 
so that in those high pressure moments that we come in contact with, we know what to do. Real quick, one that happened for me was in December. You've heard me share this. My one and a half year old son was choking to death, literally to death. And thank God I was trained in CPR and knew what to do. Was I completely freaked out in that moment? Hell yeah, I was. And my eight-year-old son's never seen me so beside myself, but immediately kicked in. I knew exactly what to do and he was fine. But without that planning and preparation, I probably would have been in shock and I wouldn't have taken action to change the outcome. And for me, that was the big takeaway from Joe today. Yeah, absolutely. And just a real quick plug, uh, and thanks for bringing up about the, the growth, well, adaptability, uh, but the first uh, module, growth mindset, and, and we felt that was most important of helping give people the courage and the confidence. And get, how, how do you give yourself permission to overcome that? So it ties in beautifully with that. Uh, that is available. You can actually go up and get some information about that on my website, Success Performance Solutions. Type into the search growth mindset. It will pop up. You can learn about the growth mindset module. It's a 30-day module that uh, is, is going to be the, that, you know, taking those one step at a time, micro steps, one uh, literally for 30 days of how to build up the courage to do whatever you need to do. It may be asking for that interview, asking for that raise, asking uh, for that promotion, changing a career, taking a new course, what, whatever it may be related to the convergence of people, technology, and business. That's going to be the start. And then we're working on the resilience module after that. But please go up to the website, Success Performance Solutions, and find out. And you'll be hearing a lot more about that. I'm Jason Cochran. You've been listening to Geeks, Geezers, Googleization. Be sure to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And I'm Ira Wolf. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. Until next time, don't let the shift hit your plans. <laughs>